Ah, all right, everyone's in. Hello. 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 Hey, guys. Sorry, oh. we guys didn't get an invitation earlier. Uh, I thought I invited everybody, but uh, okay. So, been an eventful couple of weeks. I I think that you would agree. Um, uh, you know, if not, uh, you may not have been reading your email um, over the last uh, few days and weeks, but um, there's obviously been a lot going on. So let me post the agenda again, everyone, and I will also share my screen uh, because for the life of me, I cannot get Google Drive to work when I am doing it from Open Worm. All right. So we have a new website. You may have noticed. Round of applause to Mateo for getting that up and Giovanni's involved the technical parts, but largely masterminded by Mateo. Bravo. Um, we also have a, uh, a new iPhone iPad app, um, and that really kudos goes out to a gentleman named Rich Stoner, uh, who you may not have met, but who is an independent app developer and um, hacker extraordinaire. So bravo to him uh, for that. Um, and uh, you may have noticed that there was a picture sent around of an article in Wired uh, print. And uh, I just saw, actually, in the iPad version of Wired UK. Um, it is only Wired UK, by the way. They are separate publications. Um, there, there is a new article out there as well with a pretty awesome movie of a fly through through the neck dome. Uh, that, that I don't think any of really can take credit for other than the author. Uh, I found, hi, Andre. I found that they got, um, they got it mostly right. Um, uh, obviously, I would have liked to have been cited less uh, and have some of your names appear, which is what I implored them to do. Um, but um, I think they, you know, they fix on an individual to the, for the purpose of the narrative. But pretty exciting. Ah, yes, there you go. I don't know. I don't think people can really see it very well with the glare. We basically just, yeah, the glare is, you know. Um, anyway. Um, but it is, it does serve as an exciting ad for the, uh, the project, and um, we've seen, uh, you know, by searching around and doing some Google searches, we've seen ripples of the uh, project uh, links popping up on other sites and folks encouraging other people to check it out. Um, the analytics for the site, um, the analytics for the site are uh, kind of, uh, are up quite a bit. Although, actually, I think it's unrelated to the Wired article. Um, as far as I can tell, our analytics are up like two, three times over our normal on openworm.org uh, because of an uh, article in Hacker News about the Human Brain Project uh, where we are cited by a gentleman who we have seen on IRC in the past, so, um, which is very cool. So anyway, um, so there's a lot of exciting stuff going on. Um, and uh, a lot of renewed interest, I think, in the project. Um, it's always nice. It's always nice to have uh, you know, some nice, some nice press. But of course, uh, we must stay focused um, to our task, uh, and must. Uh, it's always nice to be recognized, but uh, I think it just reemphasizes that we have a lot to do, a lot still to do, a lot to focus on, a lot of work to get done, um, and to continue to demonstrate that to the public through packaging our stuff up and um, giving folks um, something to use. Yeah. So um, does, does anybody want to comment just on all that stuff, that uh, all that recent activity, website, app, Wired article? It's pretty cool. We, uh, we also, um, I, I have tested the iPad article, and if you tap openworm.org, it's just the very last thing, the last bit of text at the very bottom of it. It does forward you to the website, which is great. Um, so it's a nice way that it's actually physically connecting, well, physically hyperlinking folks right into the site from the iPad app. So I'm hoping that we'll get traffic from that too. So I think folks who read Wired are a pretty cool demographic of folks to you know, know about the project. So. All right, good. 
Um, and so now moving on. So GitHub milestones uh, and issues um, continue to be, I think, the place where we are putting our roadmap. Um, I do want to write a narrative around you know, these particular issues, but continues to be the place where we're kind of focusing on what we're doing. Um, I, you know, there's a few things now that uh, have some closed tickets, so we're obviously making progress on the um, perspectives paper, which is good. We had another meeting in the last two sprints. Um, and we have some closed issues here on the Geppetto platform. And we have closed issues on OpenWorm website update, which I guess now we can probably close more of them. Uh, some of the other things, though, we haven't quite connected to closed issues yet. So I know that we're still obviously working on quite a bit, um, having a look over at the issues and looking at what's being worked on. I see a lot of good stuff happening uh, spread out across the project. Different folks um, are doing different pieces, so that's excellent. Um, if you have anything to update on this, please go for it. It's very easy. You can just click on the, click on the issue and uh, you know, go into the tag and, um, and uh, you, can just, uh, you can just get rid of the tag like that. Um, similarly, if there's something you are working on which is not on this list, um, go ahead and add it. Um, this is now pretty directly hyperlinked from our site. So it is easier than it has ever been for folks to uh, see exactly what we're working on. So, um, and, and, and there's a few good reasons to do this as well beyond just like infor informative. Um, the more that people see that we are working and what we are working on, the more they're encouraged to jump in and help us. Um, so we, in fact, got a, a contributor from Argentina who's been working on some data visualization. He's also volunteered to help us do this internationalization, um, which I think is a reasonable compromise. And we had that discussion a little while ago. Um, we're going to make it generally available to have the site multiple languages and not, um, but not uh, change the official language of the project. Um, so he actually, I've actually invited him to join this meeting, but he's unavailable uh, today. But hopefully we'll see him later. His name is Gaston. Uh, there's also a gentleman named Neil Shaw who has downloaded our uh, simulation engine and installed it and run it. He's running the demos, um, and I think that's as a prelude to uh, seeing if he's interested in jumping in and getting involved in the actual coding side. So that's very cool. Uh, there's a gentleman named Jim Lacey, who you may have seen on the uh, forums, who is dipping a toe in the water of multi-compartmental simulation. And um, I think we've got a meeting late, later on this week to discuss that. So all these things, I think, are good signs of folks seeing that there is life in the project. Um, on the mailing list, I think, is also contributing to that. But um, making sure that we're keeping our, our issues updated there will also help. Um, also, you know, we have kind of a complex project. So the more that people see what issues we're working on and the kind of breakdowns of what we're doing, um, it'll also help to give people a sense because I think Mateo did a great job of visualizing, making very visual the different sub-projects that we're working on. Um, but I think that GitHub even helps when folks dig in to the, um, you know, beneath the surface um, to see, you know, what we're doing on a regular basis. So I'm trying to keep that as up to date for me as well. All right. Um, and then there's the wiki. I think the wiki is not in such a great state compared to the website, unfortunately. Um, there are some pieces here uh, that we're adding, but um, you know, I've been I had a big push on it uh, I think a week ago, and it's sort of slowed down a little bit since then. Um, so please, for your pieces, feel free to add additional uh, information on those parts <laughs> on those parts where um, where you have um, expertise and knowledge. Um, some of those things that you've already written are down here, but they're kind of in a poor state. So um, if those are pages that you've written in the past. Please uh, try to, you know, revise them and fix them from the conversion from Google Code and put them up here so that finally we can we can deprecate our Google Code repository that I think a lot of you are eager eager, eager to do. Yes. Okay. Good. So um, then, uh, so Andrew Leifer, um continuing to, to be a strong supporter of the project. Um, one thing that happened this week uh, on Twitter, uh, you may or may not have noticed, is that we got asked a pretty direct question from a, a lab 
um, whose Twitter handle is According Lab, about um, uh, get, got into some pretty serious details about C. Elegans biology, and uh, we prompted him to post that question on uh, the biology stack exchange, uh, which he did, uh, and uh, outlined in great detail, linked to one of his academic papers. And then we pointed Andrew Leeper at it, all via Twitter, and said, you know, we're coming up with a good answer, but, uh, you know, maybe Andrew Leeper wants to take a crack at it. And he wrote a brilliant answer, and so then we kind of decided, well, maybe we shouldn't answer it all, uh, because really, what, could, what more could we say? Um, but that was a really cool thing, because that's a place where I think somebody came to us because they knew that we were working on the worm, um, but they didn't, know, they didn't know anything about this researcher who could answer their question, even though they were, you know, an academic. So um, <clears throat> we actually connected. We, did, we made a connection there, which I think is, is really cool. And, and so on my way to London uh, next week for, or in two weeks, I guess, for another trip, I am going to stop by New York, and I'm going to take a train down to Princeton, and I'm going to um, meet up with Andrew, and, uh, and we're going to talk um, just about how things are going. So Alex and I have been exchanging some emails with him, actually digging into uh, the data set that he shared with us. Um, and he's also offering to put some uh, code of his that he has on a private GitHub repo out into the public. Um, and probably most appropriate for him to do that under his own username uh, rather than under OpenWorm. But we'll, we can certainly you know, link to it. And if needed, we can um, clone it um, uh, under ours and, and perhaps do pull requests into the future. But um, he, this uh, code is more on the, on the side of the, the image analysis, which we don't have as much experience with, but you know, he, he has a lot. So um, anyway, he's, <laughs> he's extremely busy because he's just starting up a new lab, like just starting up a new lab. And he's a professor, so he's teaching. So um, the fact that he has any time at all for us is, is just a huge honor. So we put him on our contributor list. Um, we've also been interacting with, uh, with the postdoc of Meijen, trying to get um, some of their videos and recordings um, that we're really uh, grateful that they're you know looking into their library and helping out with that. So um, so that's very good. Uh, then this weekend I'm going up to LA. I guess I'm just doing a lot of traveling. I just fit in these these things kind of alongside other things. Um, but I'm going to sit down and have coffee with Tim and uh, Christian Grove and check in with uh, the worm based side of things as well as you know Tim and, and, and all the stuff that he's doing. Um, actually, another update there. So uh, Tim and I submitted the C. elegans connectome uh, to, in, in NeuroML to um, neuromorpho.org. And uh, this has been, I think I've told you about this several months past, where we've been going back and forth on curating the metadata for them. And uh, that process finally got completed. Um, and uh, so they've accepted the data set. And they said that they're going to put out an open worm branded uh, you know, set of morphologies of the C. elegans uh, neurons in, in NeuroML slash MorphML um, in their next release in April. So that's going to be a really cool um, just integration and, and a way to get folks who are excited about morphology to you know, come over to this uh, project. Um, some interesting things because they're very um, vertebrate, mammalian centered, and so they kind of wanted us to say, you know, is this are these interneurons or motor neurons? And in some cases, you know, the invertebrate neurons are kind of both. So um, we had to draw some interesting distinctions. But anyway, we are continuing to contribute to the open communities, uh, you know, and, and the repositories where things are. So um, anyway, oh. that's, that's cool. yep. Sorry, what have you? Um... Uh, given them the metadata for those? Yeah. How have you given them? How? Uh, in the spreadsheet. OK. I think I know what you're asking, which is yeah. this should all be consolidated, right? Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, I'm assuming that you've been consolidating it, but uh, um, is, is that in? Yeah. So we, 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 added, we added properties to our existing neuronal cell list. So that's. That was all there to begin with, um, and it, it continues to be in this. this the, the essential thing is this particular Google Doc, uh, this, this Google spreadsheet, which if we want to clone that now and into the GitHub, I think we should just download the XLS X and put it in there. But then after that, 
they looked at it, and then they went and they took it, and then they started adding columns to it, okay, on their side. And then they asked us to review that. And then we added some things to that. Um, and that's the thing. They wanted to align it more along the kinds of properties that they have in Neuromorpho. So now the consolidation challenge is to take back that set of properties, which are kind of somewhat different from a different perspective than the way ours were, and reintegrate them back into that spreadsheet. And that last part hasn't happened. So um, that's kind of what the landscape for that looks like right now. Um, okay. yeah. And then we should... And then shall we update the script to, to bring those properties in the NeuroML itself so that they can, yeah. for instance, be visualized uh, on yes. OSB? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if there is just one uh, spreadsheet which contains as much metadata in whatever format as possible, this could be nice and easy to get a Python script which pulls this out, puts it into the NeuroML files, and you can have structured metadata in uh, NeuroML version 2, and then that can be... Um, read out in the uh, OSB visualizer or any uh, anything else, it can uh, have it in the same kind of RDF-based metadata format that uh, SPML files will use, and then it opens up a, a lot of other avenues for other um, databases and other kind of uh, visualization and analysis tools to read that metadata. Yes. Um, good. There is, I'm trying to bring up the, the sheet that I believe is the sheet. Um, just to confirm. Well, anyway, we, we can do some of this offline, but the, the one that we sent is... Yeah. Okay. I don't want to. I don't hold it up right now. Let me. Let me look through it, and I'll. Um, I'll show you which one it is. But it is. It is. The the set of them are all in the public repository under biological details. So have a look under that folder, under Drive. Okay. So anyway, getting through the rest of the meeting updates. Those are basically all of them for me. I can think of right now. I mean, we. I guess we had we had another publication meeting. That would be the last thing. Publications meeting. We added um, some text on on VET. Now looking for two more figures for the other sections. Um, and upcoming meeting. Uh, I don't know, what is it, next week? I'm not sure. Uh, we have it scheduled though. So uh, let's turn to the rest of you. And last time, I think I said that I was going to look to Siberia for our updates first, because they've been left to the end too often. So we will do that. Um, let's start with Andre. How are you? Um, yeah, can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, microphone is working. OK, fine. Well, I have fine things, uh, and uh, my results uh, during the last period are the following. Uh, I'm still working on fixing, searching and fixing bugs uh, in um, PCI's PH, because, um, well, it's, it's not very nice to move uh, forward uh, with making uh, complex uh, additional uh, stuff. Uh, when uh, something still works, uh, in a way we uh, still not <laughs> completely understand. Well, I have uh, found uh, one quite serious bug and already fixed it. Uh, the reason was uh, the following. Um, there is a number of particles uh, now which correspond to uh, boundary particles which uh, should uh, never move uh, during the simulation. Uh, but, well, the data set um, is uh, updated anyway uh, at each step. And there are a lot of uh, working uh, buffers with uh, data. 
So uh, the error was uh, in the following. Um, data set for um, boundary particles um, was not um, well uh, we expected that uh, it is always uh, a constant and nothing uh, changes in it uh, but it was not so uh, so um, so this buffer containing this information was uh, overwritten. Um, so at next uh, step of the cycle, uh, it was um, it should be updated, but it wasn't, uh, and it was filled with uh, some unexpected data, which was in memory uh, after work of uh, other different functions. Uh, so I have found it, and fixed, and. After this, uh, well, I have noticed it because uh, I had quite strange values of uh, pressure at uh, these particles, so that's why I, I, I could found, find it. Uh, now, pressure values are uh, absolutely correct, and the behavior of particles even became uh, significantly more smooth especially uh, on the boundaries uh, and um, now I like uh, how the system behaves um, so this this moment is finally fixed it's all right uh, but uh, we still have sometimes uh, indeterministic behavior there is some another source of um, such problem uh, I have no solution yet, but I have studied um, this um, phenomenon. Uh, previously, I expected that we uh, have a source of these different uh, trajectories, trajectories of the system uh, when we start from uh, same initial conditions and go to a different result. I thought that uh, we uh, get small, uh, small um, source of error, which is um, accumulated uh, over uh, many uh, cycles, um, like some small error uh, in calculations, but it's not so. For example, we have 300 of cycles uh, of integration where everything goes uh, identically and then for a few particles something happens and their values change uh, at once and very significantly uh, so if we uh, trace uh, one uh, particular <laughs> particle um, we can notice that it suddenly jumps to somewhere its coordinates uh, move uh, very seriously by uh, or due to uh, some unexpected reasons well it sounds simple but mm, at different times uh, it happens for different particles so I cannot um, just fix uh, the number uh, when it happens and the particle uh, for which it happens. <laughs> um, so I need to invent some a method uh, of uh, detection uh, that this situation happened to um, make some uh, <laughs> calculations um, to well, to roll back uh, the uh, sequence of uh, sequence uh, which uh, lead to a uh, current situation, but I notice it only when it happened. So now I'm thinking about how to debug this, but I still think that we 
should not um, move further without fixing this. It's quite serious and um, unpleasant bug, which should be removed as soon as possible. So this is what I was doing. Thanks for your attention. Maybe I told <laughs> more than I should because of many words. That's good. Mike, did you, get, did you get your question answered? <clears throat> uh, yes, I think so. Andre, yes. in the chat, there in the chat, there's a. I asked a question, and it was answered by Giovanni and Matteo. I think quite. I think it was answered quite satisfactorily. But can you confirm that uh, Matteo and Giovanni's answer is the correct one? About uh, wh what I mean by boundary particles? Yes. Okay. Well. Uh, in all uh, our previous versions, um, there was no boundary particles. Um, just uh, the walls uh, existed to limit uh, particles uh, from escaping uh, our simulation box. Um, well, one of the particles uh, which we use uh, to make PCI's pH contained information that um, boundary particles um, are much more um, well, it's more convenient and more physically correct uh, to use uh, such particles so they um, are used uh, to compose uh, walls to calculate um, pressure on them uh, and um, pressure and density um, and some uh, repulsion uh, force field um, well what it gives to us um, for example we, with using a boundary particles we can make um, much more um, complex uh, surface, boundary surface, than just um, a flat wall or a bottom plane. We can make dif different difficult, difficult stuff. Uh, maybe even um, we can use particles of different type uh, to make um, different types of movement of uh, warm over it. So it's some additional feature which we introduced uh, looking into the future to have more flexible um, capabilities here. So Andre, I've, I've asked a question as well um, in the chat here about memory management. Memory management, one of more difficult challenges. Well, yes, that's right. Mm, maybe, maybe we should pay enough, uh, pay additional attention to memory management, because previously I was focused on using a limited number of uh, data buffers. Um, to well to use memory quite optimally, but at the same time uh, the source code was not um, very easy to read and even easy to modify uh, because some uh, data buffers were used well quite in a quite difficult uh, manner. Uh, so once, for example, we use it to store uh, velocities, and for non-moving boundary particles, the same uh, data is, uh, same data structure is used to store uh, normal vectors. Uh, because we need them, uh, and velocity is never used. These particles do not move. 
but uh, if um, somebody who would like to modify uh, such a code um, doesn't know about this, <laughs> uh, he can make the yeah, changes um, which will uh, interfere with this effect or this behavior of the program. So only a person who um, is aware of uh, all such uh, programs behavior can um, do changes without errors. <sighs> okay, this so I'm basically what I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to get out here, and I'm, and you can follow the chat a little bit um, in the uh, in on the side there. But I'm trying to I'm I'm just thinking to myself that um, you know that, that some of the abstractions that Java provide would potentially allow for I guess it's not just a memory management issue as much as it is just trying to just putting the right thing in the right buffer at the right time, probably, kind of thing. Um, yes. So I'm just wondering if there are some abstractions of data structures, you know, that we could use here where, um, you know, things would work um, as expected um, because they were built up on a foundation of abstractions um, and you could test at every layer, uh, you know, where things were going right and, and going wrong. Um, since Giovanni is, you know, is doing this port and he's working back and forth on it, I was asking him, you know, how he's seeing it from the Java implementation side. Um, and um, so anyway, I, I don't think there's really much more to say here. Obviously, you know, this this is a hard challenge in, in C++. It's a hard challenge in any language. Um, but um, it, I think that what Giovanni is doing may lead to some better tests uh, that, um, you know, can help to the pinpoint where some of these issues are, because obviously it's complex. Yeah, obviously, uh, I, I, I'm gonna. If we do that, I'm gonna need Andre's help to come up with meaningful tests. And because at the moment, what I what I did importing it, it was a blind porting. Uh, it was a blind port. I just took the code as it was, and basically ported it to Java. It's obviously the structure has changed a bit as in the part the model generation and all the particles are created uh, somewhere else and we're just passing down a, a file. So that takes away some of the noise in the code. But uh, we don't have the unit tests and uh, that, that's probably the next step. Like, uh, so, for example, like if you write unit tests for the functions that you're most worried about, at least, and just make sure that the numbers are coming out of those are fine, that helps. So, if you break it in the future, all the tests will break. Uh, it's some kind of a fail-safe. Uh, but, I mean, yeah, it could be anything, just because this is, like, parallel execution, so uh, it's not easy. It's not that you do unit tests and it's done. You do unit tests, it may help you understand where the problem is, but you still need to find it and troubleshooting OpenCL is not uh, user-friendly at all. And uh, so I, it's the challenges of working with these uh, technologies at the bleeding edge. So I'm sure Andre is doing great progress. I'm sure he'll He'll track it down, and then we can use that uh, experience in the Java implementation. Yeah. Yep. Very good. Um, do you want to say anything about the this this write up, Andre? Since we're getting here. Um, well, uh, I have a feeling that um, maybe a Java version uh, <laughs> will work without uh, the problems. <laughs> I, have, I just mentioned. <laughs> yeah, so. I'm not sure about that. I hope so, <laughs> but you're gonna have to help me understand that because, like at the moment, I wasn't able to run it because it's almost to the point that it's finished. But uh, we need, and that's why I, I I scheduled the meeting tentative for tomorrow. But if it's if that time is not fine, we can reschedule it. But basically, we are at the point that. Um, that file that we have, and Matteo, can you post uh, an example if you have the link to that file in Dropbox? Uh, 
so basically that file that we have, we need to add the Elastic Matter stuff to that file and I need Andre's and Sergey's help to understand um, what we need to add to that. Uh, well, about uh, the tomorrow uh, meeting, um, Sergey uh, asked me to tell that um, next few days uh, maybe he will not be online because mm -hmm. he is uh, moving to another apartment and um, he uh, has not yet uh, connected uh, internet there so um, possibly uh, we should I, I, yeah, I, think, I, I think we would like to uh, communicate also with him at our meeting yes so I can write a letter when um, he will tell me that he is already online and we can plan the meeting yeah, uh, uh, into account. Maybe we can do, uh, like, if he's moving to a new apartment, we can do Monday or Tuesday then. Uh, or whenever it becomes available. But I, I mean, it doesn't matter when it is as long as it happens. So you see this file that Matteo linked into the chat. So basically, we need to update that file with the Elastic Matter stuff and, like, uh, kind of particles, because now it's not always uh, a normal standard particle, but it can be elastic matter, it can be a boundary particle. So we need to include that stuff into this model, and that's basically what we want to talk about at the meeting. And that that's all we are missing at the moment. So everything else has been ported. So the code is pretty much the same code that's in C++, now we have in Java. It does the same stuff, but as soon as we update the model, we can try to run it, basically. Because if I run it now with the old model, it's going to break down. Um, so yeah, that's that's also an update about the stuff that I've been working on, which is the SPH porting to the simulation engine. And uh, that's, as I said, it's pretty much getting there. Um, we're just missing the model generation, and after that we can actually try and see if it works. And there will be an exciting test. <laughs> I've been writing code for a month and a half, and like dreading the moment that you hit uh, run. That's cool, though. That's yeah. Uh, Mike asks a good question: whether the plan is completely moved to the Java implementation. Uh, I think uh, it depends, as in, obviously, uh, <laughs> we're not going to force anybody <laughs> to use the job implementation. What ideally I would like to happen, though, is to very pragmatically prove that uh, it is a better environment for development, so that we make it as easy as possible so that uh, for instance, even Andre feels that he's more productive working uh, with that implementation uh, compared to the one that he's using now. But I would use exactly these as, as sort of the uh, basically the variable whether to decide if everything moves to Java or not. If we make it as good so that we can. Uh, so that uh, both Andre, Sergey, and all of them, they can work on these uh, bet in a better way than they're currently doing, uh, then the answer will be yes. But I want it to be something that happens naturally, not something that we're saying, OK, now C++ is dead. No, C++ is going to be alive as long as it's going to provide some benefits to Andre and Sergey. If we can make the Java implementation and the whole environment so good that uh, they prefer it, then yes, we can forget about C++. Survival of the fittest, <laughs> exactly. Optimization, evolution. Uh, yeah, very good. Um, OK, but, great. Uh, I see also. Uh, Go ahead. Um, she told me, um, asked me to, to, to tell, um, he uh, already uh, added for uh, special session for um, 
well, he made a lot of changes, reorganized the code for better. Well, I haven't seen it yet, but <laughs> he told me that there will be. Oh yeah, I think I. Composition uh, of different I, logical blocks, like graphics in one place. Um, Suppose uh, OpenCL calculation. So on. he told me he will try to put it into uh, today, or well, may maybe tomorrow. About his uh, impact uh, during the last two weeks. Oh yes, I think I think he put it in already. Yes, in fact, I've, uh, I've sent some check-ins from Sergey. He, yeah. he sent me an email with updates, which I'm now gonna put right now into the yeah. uh, into the document, uh, and, and, and it contains links. So let me just paste that in right now, uh, so everybody else can see it. So yeah, it looks like start a refactoring of old SP, uh, PCI SPH. He's changed the master. Um, he started out. He started to write outline for future paper fluid dynamic application for biological modeling, and he's currently participating in the NVIDIA program test drive. He's going to try to run the engine on the Tesla K20 GPU accelerator. Yeah. What well, one one question that I have is: Is this a version basically? the same that we are porting, and this is more for Sergey. and I put a comment on the GitHub repository when it checked in, so I guess we'll let him answer that. I, I, I guess so, because I I was involved in the discussion where he was trying to figure out how to refactor that code, and we went back and forth a number of times, uh, so this is nice. Uh, yeah, the, the only one thing, though, that I'm not sure I understand is the latest branch, the latest working branch was the integrated one, and I was expecting either that to be merged first to master before making any changes, while the check-ins now seems to be more kind of remove everything, re-add everything from master, yeah, and I... merged it manually, I think. Okay, well, in that case, we should probably uh, try to avoid that, otherwise it's a nightmare to track what's changed. Yeah, I know, but uh, so he changed a lot of stuff. It changed the, completely. He restructured the code completely uh, from the discussions we had. So, I mean, that kind of merge could have been difficult. But yeah, in theory, you should just merge it. But uh, he basically removed all the code and put a new one in. But uh, And it's now back on the master. Oh. Okay. So, does that take care of Andre, Giovanni, and Sergey, who's not here? Okay. Great. And there's Alex, just in time, I think. Wait, is he actually in? There we go. Hi, Alex. Okay. Sorry, I forgot to pay for the internet. Forgot to pay for the internet? <laughs> yeah. What you have to drop into something here? <laughs> huh? You have to drop coins in somewhere? Uh, no, I just uh, pay from my credit card. OK. <laughs> All right. So um, anyway, it's, it's, uh, it's time for your update, actually. You've come in just the perfect time. Oh, great. <laughs> uh, so basically, I worked with the data provided by Andrew. Uh, so basically, there is a video files, which are one thing, and the uh, MATLAB file which consists of the data we actually need. Um, the Python library, or we, to which uh, Stefan uh, pointed me to, actually worked fine, and now I have this data. Uh, the main question is how this data was obtained. I mean, uh, whether Andrew took it from the video by some kind of video processing, or it simply was recorded during the experiment itself. And it's Stephen, from, could you? It's from a video, I think. It's, uh, Are you sure? Yeah, so I think there's two videos. I think one is the one that shows the movement of the worm, and the other is the one that just shows the activity of the cells. Um, uh, yeah, but how, exactly, how, how did they uh, just trace the exact neuron? Because there are a lot of 
No one's reach. I mean, it's hard to answer. And... Yeah. Reply, reply back to the thread. Uh, CC the list. Um, yeah. Yeah, reply back yeah. to the thread uh, and, and ask him. Could, could you remind me when you will meet with Andrew in person? Yeah, it'll be uh, the 19th. 19th. Okay, 19th. So, so I should write a list before that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we can come with a list of questions, and I'm going to see if I can push him to push some of his code out. But it's good that you. So we. So he has. Uh, he has a MATLAB data file in there, guys, and um, and uh, so you know, um, Alex, I think is is getting a trial version of MATLAB, but we were trying to see if there was a way that we could get him uh, to use it even with Python. And there's a Python Mat library that uh, seems to work well. So. Um, Actually, uh, MATLAB support didn't reply to my application, so I'm not sure whether I will get this trial version or not. All right. Well, let's you see can if use you can do Python anyway. Do you, know, do you know about Octave? Uh, yeah, I do. But can it open uh, MATLAB files? Oh, yes, yeah. Um, unless, unless you're doing something quite complex, then Octave normally does everything that MATLAB does. It's just a... Uh, it's meant to be a mirrored, mirrored implement, like just another implementation of of the of MATLAB. In reality, some ex like some very complex things, like image processing toolboxes and things, won't work. But for anything you're likely to need, then MATLAB, then Octave should work, and it's completely free. Okay, great. I'll try this one. Uh, that's it, basically. Uh, uh, Stefan, do you think I should put this uh, uh, parse data into the Dropbox or somewhere else? Uh, the data I got from the MATLAB file, or I shouldn't. I mean, so um, the Dropbox is uh, so far just because of the way that it works is is invite only. Uh, so you don't. I don't think you even can make like a. Comp like you can have like a public folder, but. Um, but then it's hard to define who edits it. So if you put it anywhere in Dropbox, it's fine. Um, okay. But um, if it is a processed version of the original video, I think it well, it could also be all right on GitHub. But then again, GitHub really shouldn't, I think, be for files of any large size. This is going to be sort of 100 megabytes or something, right? So yeah. So I would I would say just put it in Dropbox um, okay. for our for our purposes, and then. If we want to push it out and show everybody else, and we can, we can talk about probably putting it on Drive and sharing it as a video, like kind of a YouTube video. Okay, great. So that's all really great. Um, that's awesome progress. And uh, so you know where this is supposed to all connect, of course, is that it's supposed to uh, give us a trace that we can feed back into Optimal Neuron, Mike, and, uh, and give us some ability to train up. Couple of these neurons while they're you know in in action. So looks like we're getting closer to that. Yep. Brilliant. Okay. Um, let's. Uh, uh, but we'll come to, we'll come to Mike in a minute. Um, let's go to Teo. Teo, did you uh, did you do anything for the project in the last uh, couple of weeks? Anything? Anything at all? Anything? Else? Just the website, and uh, I've been helping uh, a little. Joe today with the SPH. Yeah, I'm teasing. Uh, the website obviously is huge. If that's if, if that took you three sprints, uh, it would still be uh, awesome work. So. Uh, uh, well, for the website, I, I think a big shout out should go to the Twitter bar, GitHub bar, Bootstrap guys because I I really like that framework. It makes things that before were boring uh, and uh, uh, like annoying and they were a nightmare very smooth and like I, I don't know if you guys noticed but the website is also optimized for mobile devices so I mean you can browse it from your iPhone and it's not like browsing uh, a website that was designed for just a desktop uh, it, it scales pretty well I, and Quite happy. I don't think I'll use anything else anymore for making apps <laughs> on the web. To be honest, <laughs> I thought it looked. Side. I thought it looked the best on phones. Actually, it looks amazing on phones. 
Yeah, it, it, even on the even on the iPad, uh, it, it, on on tablets, it, uh, I, I really like it. Anyway, but I, I shouldn't like stuff that I do so <laughs> that much. You like it? And I'm sure I, I, I'm sure with enough time I'll hate it. <laughs> so just <laughs> like it too. Yeah, that's great. Um, so I'm now I'm sure we're on to, on to other things, but um, that's a few very good stuff. And um, and it's very easy to edit, by the way. I, I checked it out from GitHub, and I was, you know, just editing text and such. And it's it's pretty easy to add new versions and sync them back and commit them. So GitHub has been a nice place for that too. Yeah. The, the uh, one one thing maybe uh, I can mention, Stephen, on the website, uh, which you briefly mentioned earlier about the internationalization, because I okay. uh, I know uh, some folks at. Uh, different uh, opinions. Basically, a, as a compromise uh, in terms of uh, the architecture, because, uh, well, there are two classes of issues uh, for internationalization of the website. Uh, one class of issue is uh, technology side, the other side is practical uh, consequences. So, Mike, for instance, was elaborating on the practical consequences that if we translate a the website, then we are allowing Basically, we're entitling people to communicate uh, with us in languages that are not only English, which uh, obviously can be a problem. Uh, on the it other will, hand, it will it will be a problem, <laughs> and and it will be. I mean, if we start translating the website in Italian, uh, well, a, as long as myself and Joe will be on the project, it's probably gonna be okay at the very least to be able to understand an email and reply with another one that says, do you speak English, by the way? Uh, but it, for other languages, uh, uh, well, we're covered in the sense that uh, we have uh, three people that speak Russian, Stephen that speaks a bit of Spanish. <laughs> so we, we could manage to basically send basic replies back to the language that we support. I do speak some French, uh, but anyway, for the this is an open debate, uh, and we can obviously um, it, it can also be considered an experiment. I think it's uh, great if we give the possibility to other countries to know about the project, uh, and I totally share that because I mean. Uh, my mother would know much more about OpenWorm if the website was in Italian. So I think that's a, just a good enough reason to do it. <laughs> the technological side is that uh, we don't want, obviously, anything to be redundant, and we want the website to be indexed. So some ways that you can internationalize a website, uh, create problem for indexing for Google. Basically, if the data, for instance, is coming from the server, then the crawlers do not find the content. And if they do not find the content, when people are Googling, they are not going to find the content. Uh, so as a sort of a solution for this, uh, um, we were thinking to and I wrote a detailed explanation for an approach for how we could do this, basically to have some scripts that uh, integrate the sources of the website with the uh, resource files. So imagine having one resource file per each language, per each page. So for instance, home.fr, home.it, uh, one per each country, and then having a script that basically goes and replaces uh, the Street, the text uh, based uh, on the ID, and that generates different versions of the website uh, starting from the English one. That way, we basically end up having uh, to obviously rerun the script every time we update the website, uh, but this is something that can be very easily automated. Uh, we could even have a Maven build or something. And then uh, we would be but we would have versions that can be equally indexed by Google uh, all the language in all the languages. So that is uh, this one proposal for the solution of the technology problems uh, correlated to the internationalization. And I think the Argentinian uh, guy Gaston uh, said that he was interested in giving it a shot. Uh, that's it. Great. So um, while you were talking, it actually reminded me of a subject that I missed in my update, um, possibly just overshadowed because it happened earlier in the week and or earlier in the sprint and um, prior to all this excitement happening.
But um, Steve Cook uh, popped back up uh, from a hiatus and reached out, and we met and um, had a productive session. Um, he's the guy who's been helping us with the Synapse position stuff. And I wanted to share with you some of the pictures that came out of that, which I posted on Google Plus, and you may have seen anyway, but may not have known why. Um, and just to refocus us all around this whole thing of the muscle cell, right? So um, what I did, and I'm surprised I did not do it uh, before, but I actually went into our web-based worm browser, and I selected the muscle cell, and then I turned on all of the neurons that we listed several sprints ago uh, that we knew were motor neurons would project to that muscle cell. And, and I, you know, looked at some of the different, um, some of the different views that were available to see here. Let's see, there's another view from the side. Okay. And, um, and because Steve Cook has done a lot of this mapping, we basically said, you know, what I'd like to have is the synapse positions of where, you know, these neurons synapse onto this muscle and where, um, where they synapse onto each other. And he, he said, well, we know we can use the muscle cell itself as a landmark for us to define where along the muscle the synapse is, right? Because basically what you can see here is that um, all, these, all these neurons, no matter what, they all kind of follow this one path past the muscle cell, which is, which is a good check because it kind of means it's consistent with the idea that... Um, uh, you know, that these neurons, in fact, actually connect to that muscle cell, okay? And so over here, you can see some loop over the top, but he, he guaranteed me from his experience that the neurons that loop over the top of the, of the muscle cell do not synapse onto the muscle cell directly. Um, so they only really synapse here. So he sent me a spreadsheet uh, that has just these, just these neurons, uh, insofar as the ones that appear in his data set. Actually, I think it's not every single one of these that appear but I think he got like four or five of them. And he said, and he basically said, for that neuron, this, if there's a synapse that appears, it appears at this um, fraction along the, the muscle cell from zero to one. Um, and, uh, and so that data set is sitting there now. And I need, to, uh, I need to have one of you help me dig into that data set and um, basically go in and annotate the NeuroML appropriately. Um, we have to kind of figure out how to do that best, and I look at Porig here maybe for some suggestions about how to think about it. We finally turn this problem of, of synapse position into a, a pretty concrete problem, especially since we've got a limited, you know, limited set of cells that we have to, to mark up here. But obviously in NeuroML speak, you know, how we index these specific segments um, relative to this muscle cell, which doesn't appear in NeuroML at all, yes. uh, is a little bit of an abstract problem. Yes, so. I mean, that, that's the thing. I mean, um, you, ca you can, in theory, have uh, neuro uh, synapses between neurons, but if there's no, if there's nothing in there that is a muscle cell, then um, I'm not sure. I mean, just even looking at that muscle, how that might even be uh, described in terms of neuroML is a difficult one. Well, we had we had a um, we've had a neuroML representation of basically just like a giant cylinder in place of the muscle yes. cell. It didn't look anything like that. Um, uh, no, no, yeah. it, it's okay if it doesn't have the same geometry, right? Because mm. we're going to do the geometry for the physics, but um, but for the electrodynamics, I think if it's just a cylinder with appropriate with a that has the same surface area for a star. True, um, but how will that be? I mean, you can say that there is a cylinder there and there's a synapse on it, but uh, how is that actually going to be used? Uh, we're going to decorate it with the uh, muscle cell model that we're going to combine. It, we're going to take the muscle cell model that we have and wait a second. We have a neuromel muscle cell model, <laughs> so <laughs> right? That's 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 on open source brain. But, but I thought that that's just the same compartment. Isn't what? that just the same compartment? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. True. That uh, so, um, how is the uh, position of synapse actually relevant then? Is what I'm wondering. Um, don't you have a frac fraction along the compartment uh, property in NeuroML? True. Yeah. Um, but will the muscle cell be modeled as a single compartment in Neuron? 
uh, to start. Okay. No, no, we could also, I mean, we could also, like, so, so this muscle cell, just looking at it, it seems kind of flat. Yes. You could just model it as a, a bunch of cylinders all lined up. And can, uh, there's, way, there's ways to model it um, using cylinders. It shouldn't, um, off the top of my head, you know. Yeah, I mean, um, but it doesn't seem like it doesn't seem like an insurmountable problem. In, in, in I think I know. I, I think this is one of the um, worries that we might jump to the three D model too quickly. Um, th there's a lot. To be done before it actually can go in there and be fit into that 3D framework. Um, just positioning it. I mean, th there there isn't even anything there to um, simulate the presynaptic cells yet. Um, I, I'm I'm, ju I'm just not clear on what you actually want to do with this. I mean, uh, I mean, position it so that it looks correct. Um, yeah, I'm 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 not clear on what you want to actually do with this. Um, I, I, I want to iteratively build the model, okay? True. And so that means that even though it's not finished at any given stage, we mm -hmm. can still move forward. And so the first one is to define the synaptic relationships between the neuromel representations of the motor neurons and the muscle cell, because right now that doesn't exist, to update mm -hmm. the... the, the synapses between those muscle cells, uh, excuse me, between the motor neurons insofar as they exist, and to have one neuromel representation in the short term that has just these eight motor neurons and whatever representation of the muscle cell we have right now, okay, so that we can have made an iteration, so that, and, you know, and that we can put to neuron, okay. I, uh, I think um, that will also give us a focal point for um, getting the dynamics of just those muscle cells because, so for example, I'm talking with Meijen, I can, we're trying to get recordings from specifically those motor neurons um, in terms of dynamics to help us, you know, run them through the pyramidal environment. But um, we have to accept that we can't make a giant leap all at once, but if we make small steps, like yeah. have a new project that just has these, these pieces, it provides a nice working bench subset of the of the network, yeah, um, I I think yeah I mean that's perfectly fine to have that and that could probably be put into a Python script where you can generate just a those eight presynaptic cells whatever presynaptic cells plus that uh, cylinder and manually place the synapses uh, that's fine um, I'm just thinking that a kind of more slightly more abstract model of the muscle cell with synaptic input uh, with realistic synaptic input and relating that to real data would be useful to have in parallel. Well, yeah, great. So, I mean, yeah. Let's focus yeah. on getting this, the neurotransmitters right, too. Yeah, I mean, that's another thing. Um, sorry, go ahead. When you say a more abstract cell model, could you specify exactly what, what you mean? Because what I'm envisag envisaging is the first iteration of what Stephen is describing is yeah. just to have a single compartment muscle cell, say, and yeah, and, and, and uh, yeah, and and that that's why I'm wondering why you need eight uh, morphologically detailed presynaptic cells. I mean, it, it fine if it's just for visualization and for just saying, well, this small part of the connectome is uh, is known in quite a lot of detail, but um, for actually trying to match that to data, um, you probably just need a single compartment and eight synaptic inputs. Um, if you see what I mean. Uh, yes, I do see what you mean. Um, although, now I might be I might be dead wrong here, but I would imagine that the morphology of the neurons, what with them being very long and thin and so on, and the morphology of the muscle cells being quite fat and uh, just big generally. Um, my hunch would be that the morphology, the, the realistic morphology of those neurons in terms of, of describing their behavior would actually be quite a lot more important than that, that more than that muscle cell could probably be much more accurately modeled yeah, as an yes. isopotential yes. single compartment. Yeah, but I mean, uh, the, f the first iteration I would uh, assume would be just the synaptic properties for the synaptic input. 
into the cell. Um, I have no problem trying to focus on what those on what those properties are too. Yeah, I'll, I just I mean we just right now we have positions to work with, um, so I figured that they, they, help they, they're just and, yeah. As far as I know, there there just isn't enough detail there already as far as the kind of electrical properties for the axial resistance. Um, the spiking properties of those presynaptic cells um, as a first um, iteration, it would just be a point input, a point synaptic input. We can make some approximations as to what those things are and start to see if we can come up with that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. So, for um, example, I mean, there are like a few, a very few papers that have actually recorded from neurons electrophysiologically. I mean, it. The, the neuron kind of dies, but I think some of those basic properties you're talking about, like what is the cap capacitance of a membrane of a of a C. elegans neuron, is something that we can we can try to find. Um, yeah. See if it's appropriate so that we get something in the first order. Okay. Okay. Um, how about we set that as a kind of one of the goals for London to try to get that uh, positioned. Uh, muscle and those specific uh, connections into one neuromel file or yep. similar configuration in NeuroConstruct? Yep. yep, I think so. And I also think that maybe, Tim, maybe we can look at those specific motor neurons as well, just based on what we've already found and just kind of focusing our attention to make sure that we can um, say with, with good certainty and with references what are the neurotransmitters of those guys? Um, to what extent are there gap junctions between them? Um, yeah, so that we can maybe add that in and um, make sure that we can see if we can get anything about the synapses. So, for example, some of the um, some of the EM shows multiple synapses from one cell to one muscle cell, from one motor neuron to to, to, to the muscle cell. So, if there's two connections versus just one then at least we want to have that in the metadata, if not potentially, you know, scale up the influence of that, you know, with a weight. Um, but, okay, good. So, um, anyway, this is, this is good. This is productive. I mean, if anything, this gives a sense of moving beyond the muscle cell, why, why do it? We can see a picture of what that looks like graphically. It starts to give you a sense of, like, how we can potentially iterate this beyond just that one muscle cell, and I agree we yeah. should take conservative steps. Yeah, I mean, just to sum summarize my concern about this, uh, I don't think yet I have seen or have, there is a good model of a single synaptic tr transmission between a motor neuron on either another neuron or the muscle cell itself. So until there is that um, jumping to the next step of uh, multi-compartmental presynaptic cells onto a detailed muscle, is too big a jump forward, but okay. Let's let's try to focus on giving a, a model of a synapse that is that is appropriate, and um, um, I think I tend to feel like we can pull one from another model. But I think that you're right that we should constrain it. Um, yeah, I think the the, the the big problem is going to be getting uh, invertebrate models. Full stop. That I've looked for Drosophila. There's not very many out there. So okay, okay. No, I mean this is really good. So. Um, as I'm fleshing out the actual like content, I think it's kind of going to be a hackathon kind of environment when we're there, and I think this is this is a really good thing for us to hack on collectively. So. Very cool. Okay, um, getting to the end here, um, Ford. Since you've been speaking, do you want to you want to pick up, and then we'll go to Tim and Mike real quick. Can we officially yeah, call it call it the hackathon? Sorry to interrupt. Uh, well, maybe, but again. Uh, you know, we um, go over I was speaking a little bit beforehand <laughs> because of because of space um, in the rooms. If we open it up to everybody, we may very well. No, get no, just us, just us. Yeah. So, but we open, uh, war, open warm hackathon, and we go there and do work. Are people, are people happy with that? Oh, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> All right, we can do that. <laughs> Okay, so just very briefly, I mean, I haven't unfortunately done too much specifically on Open Worm uh, the last few weeks, um, but uh, I have been slowly getting back into the NeuroML uh, Java um, modules, which are being used by the Open Source Brain Visualizer, uh, trying to get 
bees and Len and various other things to work nicely together. And hopefully in the next week we have a slightly updated version of uh, Neuromel 2, uh, we're calling it Neuromel 2 Beta, uh, which these libraries will be compliant to, some of the Python stuff will be compliant to, and uh, lib Neuromel that uh, Mike's working on, and a number of other models out there. So this hopefully will all benefit the um, open worm model. Um, but again, unfortunately, not too much specifically on the, um, uh, for example, the NeuroConstruct project itself. Oh, I remembered one more thing. Um, are you putting in an abstract to CNS? Um, it was on the long finger, but um, I think maybe um, myself and Matteo probably should do something on the open source brain visualizer. Okay. Uh -oh. I'm I'm wondering if I'm if if we should put something in for open worm potentially, um, and uh, see if we can um, get a get a European cohort to go. Um, just because I think that we've kind of got to the point now. It is the Computational Neuroscience Society's meeting. Uh, I always hear good things. I've never really been able to attend. Um, but I think maybe the project should have some representation there. Um, Can we do a, a joint one uh, of the NeuroML visualizer with the OpenWorm connectome as a showcase? Conceivably. I will have to check with Angus, uh, who from the be. lab from the lab you can actually fund, so um, yeah. we will... Yeah, it, could be, it, it doesn't have to be a thing that, 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 that you guys funded. I'm not, that's not what I'm... I'm not uh, trying to influence you to do that. I'm, I'm just asking, actually, just amongst the, the group if we think it's a good idea, and, you know, we can put it in, we can put it in as a separate thing. Um, so I think, I think you should feel free to feature <coughs> in the open source brain thing, but obviously you guys have a purpose of making sure that everybody knows about the open source brain thing. Um, um, I, there, there is a change this year with uh, CNS that you have to, have to actually register for the meeting, main meeting itself before you can submit an abstract. Really? Uh, yeah. And do, so, it's due in February, and you have to register in February for the meeting in July? Yes. Wow. Bummer. Okay. Well, that's kind of a commitment. Um, what if your ab what, so that means if your abstract is not uh, accepted, then you're still registered for the meeting? Uh, I think... I, I think it's just to prevent people uh, registering not showing up, so um, or uh, submitting an abstract and not showing up. I'm not sure of the the uh, all the scenarios, but in general, if you don't go or don't oh. get accepted, then you'll get your money back. There's various scenarios. You don't get money back. All right. Even, uh... <laughs> Pile on, Mike. Um... Yeah, OK. Well, anyway, it's good to know. Um, all right, fair. Um, also, I did see that you opened up some issues on GitHub, which is actually a very useful contribution, um, just in terms of getting more specific on some of the NeuroML stuff, yeah? Yeah, uh, they were on the specifically on the NeuroML C. Elegans Connectome project, but you can't have milestones and issues across projects, which is yeah. unfortunate. Um, so I just moved the same ones there, and I'll hopefully move a few more, or open a few more, just to organize some of the stuff that I'm intending to do. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. Yeah, we've been thinking about this as doing it kind of hierarchically, so, um, but we want to keep issues that are very, you know, that are at the level of code changes down in the repos where they belong, and, um, and then, you know, we can reference a higher level thing that's more coarse-grained in the, in the major project where all that stuff gets tracked, but um, I think yeah, I think keeping them down in the in the repo where they uh, where they're most applicable is, is a good thing. Okay, great. Um, Tim. Yeah, I've been uh, trying to play around with a little bit of uh, uh, data representation. I want to show um, my one of the things I did. I don't see it. Here. Let's see. Chance of abstract not getting accepted is low. No, that's good. You guys see the um, the data there? You see yeah. Things wrong with it? Yeah. Ooh. So this, I, I think you guys have seen this kind of thing before. So like I can click on over here like motor neuron, and it brings up. I, I just did a small subset of our, our neurons. Click on any one of these, 
it, it gives you more information, like with the neurotransmitter. If I click on uh, acetylcholine, I get that it's a neurotransmitter. Uh, we can look at neurotransmitters. You can click on like dopamine. You see what neurons uh, are, are used dopamine. I uh, have an exons in here. You click on that. You can see what what neurons uh, use that particular exon. Um, so this this kind of um, break it down by sensory neurons. Um, we break it down um, by inner neurons. So I, I just just playing around with this. I don't know what anybody thinks that this is would be good or not good. Pretty cool. What it's is this software? software? <laughs> it's called the Brain. You go to thebrain.com, or I think that's what it is. You can, you can yeah. download the software. I, and you know, I, I can go ahead and finish this off and um, post the Brain file. And there's also you can export it to HTML, um, kind of a Java uh, representation of this, but it's not as sexy as this in any way, shape, or form. I think you could actually get this too. Um, to put on the web, but um, I don't know. I was like I said, I was just playing around with it and to want to show you guys uh, see what you thought. Yeah, I think it's cool. Um, in it's general, really cool to have that on the website. Uh, yeah, using, using D tree for instance. Right. Yeah, this this is this is the thing. It's it's that um, all these things when it's it's coming to the data visualization. Um, when you post the file, then that means that somebody else is going to have to download the same software in order to play with it. Whereas, no, I, I mean I've seen this. I've seen this actually run on websites. Okay. So I know it's available to run on a website. I just haven't explored what it would take to do that. I want to get right. you guys' opinion before you know going to that stuff. Yeah, yeah. I think any. Th this is exactly what I'm talking about with the whole data visualization part of of the project. The more that we can take the data that are out there and and make them more easy to, to browse and look through. Of course, as much as we're drawing from this central, you know, a centralized version of, of all this data, um, the better. But, um, but yeah, I would love to see if there's a web-based thing uh, that's associated with this, and maybe you and I can play with it a little bit uh, this weekend. Yeah. All right, cool. All right, so you guys are telling me I'm on the right track, and that's what I wanted to know. Okay. Thanks. That's pretty cool. All right. That's all I have. Very good. And Mike. OK. So last two weeks, I've been putting a lot of enhancements into Optimal Neuron, uh, trace analysis, improving documentation, adding examples, and so on. Uh, just today, I merged the uh, merged change, which uh, Alex, uh, Alex uh, did a few weeks ago. Alex, apologies for taking so so long, but uh, anyway, I tested I tested um, tested Alex's change and it works fine. So merge that. Um, so yeah, been working on optimal neuron documentation, uh, some code refactoring, and also um, as Podrig knows because we had a meeting about this yesterday. I've been Making some great progress with refactoring of LibNeuronMail. Yeah. Uh, plan is to go for uh, version 0 0.1 release quite soon, uh, which is nice also because in while while the, this refactor while I was doing this refactoring also noticed some minor improvements which could be made to NeuronMail version two. Uh, it's nice to nice to detect these things before version two release, rather than after, of course. Um, so yeah, so uh, what you were talking about, Stephen, with regards to creating this um, this uh, model of the muscle with a with with its uh, input neurons and so on. Uh, hopefully, LibNeuronML could be useful in doing that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. certainly, so, yeah. certainly good. Um, so, I, so I think however we decide to go ahead with that, I'm sure, yeah. I, I'm sure it should be a useful component. No, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. and this is all. Oh, sorry. This, so this uh, this libneuromel stuff. Uh, so, heading towards a release. Um, on top of that, I intend to um, refactor. Um, 
pyramidal because obviously pyramidal uses libnirml as a backend for uh, for simulator interoperability and once I've done that I intend to loop all of that back into optimal neuron because I, I I'm hoping optimal neuron despite being very generic should have particularly good support for models written in pyramidal um, one other thing I'd like to say is uh, I noticed that Alex has been doing some great work with the image image an analysis and obviously like you said earlier and during the hangout that ties in really well to optimization and I think that's a really fantastic fantastic direction actually if, 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 if Alex were concentrating on uh, the image uh, quantification of behavior from the videos uh, I think that's a that's a really really smart move so yeah I fully support that that decision to work on on that cool very cool. All right. Well, we've hit the top of the hour, so the exact end of the meeting. Um, so any last comments here before we head off? All right. Great work, everybody. Um, we've got a lot to be proud of with the project and last sprint, and uh, let's keep rocking here in the next two weeks. I will see almost all of you except for the Russian guys who I promise I will find a way to see you guys in person one of these days here, um, but the rest of you I will probably touch base. Oh, last thing before we leave is that I have moved the next Hangout uh, time, or the date, uh, one day into the future, um, because I will be on a flight uh, this time in two weeks, but, um, but uh, I will be in London, and the idea for the London meeting is in fact that we will open up the Hangout at that time for those of you who cannot be in London. Um, uh, and so we will do most of us in person, but uh, the rest of you in virtually. Um, so does anybody have a conflict with that? Um, we can still change it if needed. Let's see. You say on the 21st, right? On the 21st, yes. We moved it to the 21st. No problem at all. OK. Um, Andre, Alex, is that good? Yeah. Andre, I didn't see a nod. Yes. Okay. So yes and a smile. Okay. Good. All right. Great. Thanks, everybody. Um, Thank we'll see you guys over email and various other meetings as we go. See you Saturday. You can. Bye, everybody. Bye.